plate is a form of pottery. It's not a particularly interesting plate, but there are some dishes that are actual art. Pottery goes back to ancient times. It was mostly functional and used for dishes, cups, platters, and storage. But even then, even when our ancestors were creating pottery stoneware to use, they were concerned with decorating. It was like, well, yes, we need it for eating, but why can't it be pretty as well? Many ancient pieces of pottery have been found at archaeological digs, and many have been decorated. Nowadays, we take that one step further. We recognize that pottery is an art all by itself. It doesn't have to have a practical function or use, although some pieces can. Northeast Ohio has a history of clay and things made from clay. The Canton Museum of Art, with its focus on traditional arts, has a rich collection of pottery and ceramics. This platter, created by Don Wrights, is part of that collection. Don didn't start out as an artist. He did many things. He worked as a truck driver, lumberjack, meat cutter, and diver. He brings all his past experiences into his work. He says that his past provides a reference for all he creates. George Sacco of Kent, Ohio, shares Don Wrights' love of clay and working with it. When we visit him today, he is working on a large clay dish. It's fascinating to watch this work grow beneath his hands. It's also especially fun to watch him create the grooves, pits, and lines that make each piece unique. I'll bet that at least one of his art materials is something you never thought you would see in an art studio. Also, take a look how George gets the colors he wants. Here's a hint. He doesn't paint them. He uses chemistry. No matter what I make, it seems like I always go back to plate forms and cup forms. I've probably made thousands of them. You normally, if I was going to throw this, I'd wedge it up. But since I'm going to be rolling out slabs, I don't have to do that. Wabi-sabi in Japanese means imperfect, humble, and or unconventional beauty. I like that. So that's what I'm going to be making. One of the things I like about making these things, I have to work upside down, so I can't really see what I'm doing until uh, the piece is finished. Put some of this magic texturing compound in here. These are cornflakes. Putting together random slabs here that'll end up looking kind of like a uh, clay drawing on the surface of the clay when you turn it over. See, what's going to happen, all these lines are going to show on the inside of these plates. And while I'm doing this, I'm kind of trying to visualize what these lines which is actually like a composition in the drawing are going to look like here. The smoother the clay, the better it takes the smoke when I fire it. Don't want to press too hard with this thing because I can lose my lines on the inside if I press it down too hard. Open this all the way down to the bat. Throw the foot ring. Okay. This is going to be the bottom that goes on the uh, plate, so I score it, which is like roughing the surface. Some nice gooey slip out of here, which is going to act like the glue. I might cut off wire here and cut this little baby loose from the bat. Rough this up so I get two rough surfaces that go together. Okay, that should do that. A nice solid foot there supporting supporting that uh, graceful curve. That's what we want. Because if this thing isn't stiff enough when I pick it up, the whole thing's going to crumble right in my hands, but this should be just right. But you don't want to hang on to it too long. And you can see all the construction marks 
form the composition on the inside of this. And then that uh, corn flakes will burn out. So we'll have a little pitted look going there. We got a nice edge gone. The lighter colored areas, that's from me masking that those areas off with clay, which I'm going to do right now. Then I pour chemicals around on the surface, and that's what I get this color from. This is all from the fire and smoke that creates this. So what I'm done here, I'm going to be creating uh, some uh, lighter areas. See, and the temperature only gets up to about uh, eight or 900 degrees in that sawdust kill, so this clay doesn't, uh, you know, mature or anything. And it's, you know, it just falls right off when I'm done. Okay, these chemicals I'm putting on here is gonna give me some, hopefully, a little bit of color. And I'm gonna put about four inches in the bottom here. Put this brick in here, that's what the wabi-sabi plate's gonna sit on. The tighter you pack this sawdust in here, the slower it burns. Put some straw on here, it's gonna catch real good. Now it's gotta get pretty hot for that sawdust to start smoldering, and it'll burn slowly. This thing will probably take uh, Probably all night. I'll probably take this out in the morning. After I know for sure that it's caught, I'll go ahead and cover it so it doesn't burn so fast. And then it'll just start smoking, and that's where you get all the uh, color from. Okay, here's one that uh, I fired in the kill yesterday. I just took it out. It's nice and cool. Brush all this debris out of it. My final step here is that I wax the surface on these things, but it gives it a little bit of depth on the surface. The students at Fairless High School had a great deal of fun creating their own pottery. Part of the challenge was creating textures and patterns with everyday items. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is you need to get yourself a rolling pin. So I want everybody in the first row to come get a rolling pin and a cloth. We're going to have cloths so that you can roll out your clay. Okay. Also with your cloth, some of them have textures on them. We'll leave a definite pattern in it. Make sure when you roll out your slab, it be the same thickness the whole way through. Okay, if it's too thick in one place, it may still be wet when we go to fire it and it could blow up. Well, you're going to want to keep flipping your clay over so that it doesn't get bumpy or too dry on one side. After you get your slab rolled out, what is it that you're going to use to make your pattern or your texture? Do you guys remember? Cereal. cereal. Okay, and what's going to happen to the cereal? It's going gonna, it's gonna to burn out in the kiln, right, because it gets really hot in there. When you put your cereal on there, you can either make a pattern or you can just randomly put it on there just to get some texture. So we've got the little checked little squares, bran flakes. They make little lines and your little things that look like corn flakes. If you want to put your pattern on the inside of the bowl, you need to take the bowl and put the cloth over it and, and fold the extra cloth underneath, okay? If you're worried about your stuff falling out of that, okay, you're just, you're gonna have to be real careful with it, okay? And then you're gonna flip it over. If you have a pattern that you definitely want to stay the way it is, you might wanna take the clay, put it on the desk, 
Put the cloth on top and flip it all together as one piece. In the good clay bucket up there. You can mold it exactly to the bowl shape, or you can leave it be kind of an organic shape. You can cut this extra off if you don't like it that way, but if you do like it this way, you can leave it. Some people like things neat and ordered and tidy. Other people like them better. It's kind of the way that, that nature makes them. You can put like legs or feet or a base on the bottom if you want. Because we're putting clay that shrinks on the outside of something that doesn't shrink, we're going to need a blow dryer. Remember when you're looking at the glazes, even though what, that looks orangish brown, it is not. It is the color that it says. It is green. It's leaf green. Yeah, remember our chemical reactions and sometimes heat does stuff to colors. Um, how many coats of glaze do we put on? Three. Three coats of glaze. And why is that? So that it comes out the color that it's supposed to be. Also so that it's shiny and it's waterproof like we want it to be. I'm doing mine like green and red. And on the other side I'm going to write apple jack. On this bottom part, if you don't have a foot on yours, make sure you don't, you leave just like a little circle in the center that's not glazed because we don't want it to stick to the kiln. We all use the same method, but none of them look anything alike. Um, we're going to fire them again for a second time, and when they come out of the kiln, they're going to be nice and shiny and colorful and have lots of texture. The art of making pottery is an ancient one, but some of the basics remain the same. You need clay and heat. It isn't very hard to imagine our ancestors using kilns very similar to the ones George uses, but the modern potter has things at his disposal that make creating pottery easier. The attitude towards pottery has changed since the days when our ancestors made pots and dishes because they needed them. Nowadays we can buy mass-produced dishware, but luckily, the artist realized that the true worth of a piece isn't whether or not it can be practically used, it's enough that it's beautiful. Teaching materials for sharing art are available on the web at wneo.org slash sharing art. Funding for this series was provided by the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation and Northeastern Ohio Education Association. NAOEA's members include elementary and secondary teachers, university professors, and support professionals proudly serving students attending the public schools and colleges of Northeastern Ohio.